So we've been going through the book of Acts on Sunday morning since the beginning of the year. We took, obviously, a little break for Easter and um, that sort of thing. But um, at this point in the book of Acts, I guess I want to throw out kind of a caution. Um, and, and I just want it to keep us from thinking, and it's like a big worry, but kind of thinking dangerously. Um, the last few weeks in the book of Acts, we've seen the radical conversion of Saul. Right, you remember that? Saul, one of the greatest enemies of the church. He went from being the church's greatest persecutor to becoming the, the, the church's uh, greatest missionary. Probably the most influential Christian of all time. Uh, no doubt one of the most influential people of all time. And we're gonna hear more about him in the last section of Acts. But this week, the storyline switches to the life and ministry of another major person um, in those early Christian years. One of the leaders of the Christian church, a huge giant, the Apostle Peter. We're gonna switch to him um, now. In fact, in your Bible, there's probably um, a heading that says something like the ministry of Peter as we come into this section this week. And when we get to, I think it's chapter 13, a little further down in the book of Acts in a few weeks, we're gonna see it say the ministry of Paul because we're gonna get back um, to Paul's ministry. And, And this is where I think that dangerous thinking comes into play. So I'm kind of want to alert you to that today. And, and this passage is actually a really good reset um, on that for us. I might have mentioned this before when we started the book of Acts. Um, in, in your Bible, it has like a title of the book. It says probably the Acts of the Apostles or something like that. And I just keep referring to it as Acts. But um, do you know that the original Greek um, from the, the original manuscripts of, of the Bible from which our Bible is translated didn't even have a title on this book? There was no Acts. There was no nothing. It was just... You know, it just started out like Dear Excellent Theophilus or however it starts, right? It started out like that with no title. And the whole first 50 years, um, since it was written, there was no title on it. And then after that, it just became um, Acts. And then in the second century, uh, they eventually started saying the Acts of the Apostles. And and our our books today, our, our few Bibles today, would say that, Acts of the apostles, and I think when they did that in the second century, I think that was ridiculous. I don't think that was a good idea because ultimately the Acts, as we go through the book of Acts, as we read it, we're gonna see that um, these, yeah, these are Acts that the apostles did, but it's really the Acts of God, right? It's God who did these things, right? Not not men. Um, And so uh, I know there is a great deal of focus on the people of the early church in the book, um, especially the apostles, but we really have to be careful that we're not gonna venerate these, these apostles and these missionaries and these other people that we're gonna see uh, in the book of Acts um, because really it's God who should be venerated here. Um, you see, the real story is about the work Jesus is doing um, through the body of Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, none of this is about Peter. None of this is about uh, Paul, and it's no different today. I know there are a lot of great people in the church. I know there are a lot of great people in our church doing a lot of great things, but let's never give credit to mankind, to men and women, to what really is only uh, due to God. Don't place pastors, don't place um, worship leaders, don't place the leaders of our church above everyone else because we are all one in Christ Jesus, and it's only by him um, that, that we're here in this place at all. It's Jesus who's at work and is changing lives and doing it everywhere. Jesus is at work changing lives and doing it everywhere. And Jesus does it, as we're gonna see in this morning's passage, through extraordinary means and through kind of just ordinary means. And I'd like to to show you. Let's read Acts chapter nine, verses 32 to 41, which is on page. I didn't give away my bulletin this week like last week. Uh, It is, let me tell you, wait for it. It should be page 863 in the Pew Bibles, page 1091 in the large print Bibles. And uh, Austin, as he always does, is gonna put that up on the screen for us. Acts chapter two, verses nine, uh, Acts chapter nine, verses 32 to 43, actually. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. 
In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her up in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And 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 he gave her hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known all throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be at work in our hearts. Push this word right into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Open us to see what's good and profitable and and worthy of praise in this morning's passage. Um, And God, send us away full. Send our hearts and souls away full and strengthened with faith that we might be used in your service, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's look at kind of the obvious in the passage this morning. Let's look at the extraordinary. Um, Certainly, as I've already mentioned, the apostles were extraordinary men, extraordinary men by all accounts, even by um, the the greatest uh, people who opposed Uh, the Christians in that early age, they were considered extraordinary men. Verse 32, we read, Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. Now, just try to picture this scene. This is like Billy Graham coming to Bethany Chapel this morning. Didn't know he was coming. Shows up here and he's like, "Uh, Bob, do you mind if I share a word? I'd be like, uh... Let me think about that. Yes, please come up here. And he would encourage us to hold firmly to our faith. He'd remind us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he'd probably go outside and there'd already be a million people there, right? Just waiting to hear what he was gonna say. He'd go around our neighborhood. You know, he'd probably go down the airport diner and he'd start, you know, talking to people at tables. It's just who he was like. It would have been huge news, right? It would have been in the newspaper, all over TV, right? Well, well, this is kind of what it was like with Peter showing up at the places he showed up here. It was was even bigger, actually. Uh, You know it was a huge deal because in verse 38, we see the people from Joppa, which is 15 miles away, were were already coming. Uh, They'd already, like the word already got out, right? No Twitter, right? No, no I am, no messaging of any sort, right, to get the word out. There were no cars for people to drive over, even to tell them, right? They, they, it's huge. And you see Peter performed acts worthy of talking about, right? We, We see that. First, in verse 33, Uh, Peter noticed this guy by the name of Aeneas, who'd been bedridden, bedridden. He was paralyzed, it says, for eight years. And having compassion on this guy, this guy, by the way, you notice in the text, he never asked for help. He has compassion on him, and Peter heals him like that, right on the spot. He's healed. And immediately, we see in verse 34, the man rose. But look at verse 34 and, and what you see there. Notice how Peter didn't say, healed you, get up. Right? He didn't say, ta-da. <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't say, he didn't say, well, look, guys, I did it again. Right? He didn't, that isn't the response. What does he say? He says, Jesus Christ heals you. Not look what I did, but Jesus Christ heals you. Peter takes no credit for the healing. And then there were these two guys from Joppa. That sounds like a joke, right? But really, there were two guys from Joppa that were sent by the disciples in verse 38 and they were urged to come without delay to Peter. They asked him to come to this upper room in verse 37 where a woman um, named Dorcas became sick and died. Dead, completely dead. And here you see that, that the great Peter had no power to do a thing. But Peter knew who did. In verse 40, Peter gets on his knees and he prays. And immediately the woman comes back to life and the whole city finds out about it. Peter prayed and God responded. Just like in the previous miracle, the source of the miracle is who? It's God, right? It's not Peter. Peter, just like the apostle Paul, was an extraordinary man. He's an incredible man, a man of great faith. He's a man of um, great courage, one of the greatest Christians of all time, and yet it wasn't actually Peter who was changing lives. It wasn't Peter who was due all the praise for all the mighty acts. It was God. These were things of God. These were acts 
of God. I mean, who do you know who has the power to make a paralyzed man walk? Who do you know that can raise from the dead? Right, these things aren't normal. Like if this happened, right, it, it would go viral in our age. Social media would blow up if, if, if someone keeled over. Sorry, that sounds a little crude. If someone just died in the pew here, right, um, and Lisa turns around and is like, I'm just gonna pray for you to rise from the dead, and the person goes, whoop, right back up in the pew, right? I mean, that would be all over social media. Everyone would be talking about it. It would be a miracle. And what we see in this passage are definitely miracles. But the word miracle is a word you might feel a little leery using these days. Because today, either nothing is a miracle in the culture we live in, or every single thing is a miracle, right? First, there are those who claim that miracles don't happen. They say it's scientifically impossible for miracles to happen. But that statement demonstrates actually a misunderstanding of what science is altogether. You see, miracles fall outside the purview of science. Science by nature and by its definition only deals with, this is the definition, normal and regular. And because miracles fall outside the laws of nature, they fall outside of science's ability to speak to them. All science can really say is, we can't explain miracles. On the other side are people who claim everything's a miracle. Like my wife, when she makes a meal for us every night, every Sunday night, if she's cooking the dinner for Sunday night, she says, this is gonna be the worst meal ever, <laughs> right? And then when the meal comes out, great, she goes, it's a miracle, right? <laughs> Some of us look at this thing in our pockets and we go, this thing's a miracle, right? Or it's like me when I go to, to Logan Airport and go on a flight and come back, I'm like, so where do I park my car? And then I find my car, it's a miracle. <laughs> but none of these things are actually miracles. Not that we can't thank God for them, not that they're wonderful things, not that they're awesome and great things, but we can't say they're miracles because they're not. C.S. Lewis in his book Miracles defines a miracle as an interference with nature by a supernatural power. I love that definition. An interference with nature by a supernatural power. What he's saying is that God doesn't suspend the laws of nature when miracles happen. He's saying that God interferes with the law of nature when miracles happen. For instance, if I go up to this communion table here, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a little cup on it here, and it's actually filled kind of full with juice. Um, if I come up to this communion table and I start going like this to it, what's gonna happen to that juice? It's gonna topple over, the juice is gonna go flying everywhere. Thankfully, we have a red carpet, it won't show too bad, but if, if I shake it, the, the thing's gonna topple, juice goes everywhere. Why? Because of the law of gravity, right? Gravity's gonna make it topple over. But if I put my hand out as I'm shaking the table to stop that that juice from toppling over, I've interfered in that law of gravity from that gravity's pull on that cup. And that's what miracles are like. God interferes with nature, with what is normal and regular. And why can't I? Why can't he, after all, given that he's God? Who creates the laws of nature? God. He can certainly interfere in them. Now what you can learn from all these miracles is a few things. First of all, by looking in the Bible at all these miracles, right? God never does miracles in secret. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible? They're always where people can see them. And the other thing to notice is they're not arbitrary. Miracles are never arbitrary. God uses miracles to communicate to you and me in very intentional, very purposeful ways. Miracles have a purpose. Who gets all the credit for the miracles in the Bible? God, right? And in today's passage, Peter gives Jesus credit for the miracle with the paralytic. And in raising Dorcas from the dead, Peter prays and God responds, giving God the the glory. And we see this in scripture over and over again. God gets the credit, God gets the glory for all the miracles. Every single miracle has meaning and purpose. Well, what was the purpose of the first miracle? Right, the healing of the paralytic. It says, verse 35, So in all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. It was so that the people saw the miracle and it caused them to realize what was going on here and turn to Jesus. That was the reason for the miracle. What about the second miracle, verse 42? 
and it became known throughout Al Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Everyone knew that God did these things. These, these miracles caused these people who witnessed them, caused the people who heard them to believe in Jesus Christ. That was God's purpose for those miracles, as it often is. And all these things show that Jesus is still at work changing lives and doing it through the extraordinary. Through the extraordinary. We, we, we can't stop believing that God works in extraordinary ways because he does, because he is God. Well, he also works every day changing lives through the ordinary. God uses ordinary people like you and like me all the time. I want you to notice a particular word, um, Luke, used in um, his passage twice, actually, in the book of Acts. Verse 32, he writes that Peter came down to who? To the saints. And then again in verse 41, Peter calls together who? The saints to come witness this resurrection. He mentions the saints twice. What does it mean to be a saint? Well, it doesn't mean that you're perfect all the time because no saints are. And if you, I know we have a lot of uh, former Roman Catholics in here and when you hear that word saint, you think of a dead person who the Roman Catholic Church has determined is worthy, worthy of honor above all other people, someone who is venerated, someone who you can even pray to. That's not what the Bible talks about. Um, when it talks about saints. Actually, that's something that um, Pope John the 15th in the 10th century um, brought about. A biblical saint is simply anyone who's a Christian. Anyone who's a Christian, the Bible talks of, as being a saint. And this word saint literally means someone who's set apart. It means someone who's different. It means a holy one. Well, how do you become a saint, you might say. How do, how do I sign up for that? How do I become a saint? How do I get set apart? How am I made different? How am I considered a holy one? And it works like this. Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross to pay for those who believe in him, who, those who are putting their trust in him for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to overcome sin and death. And in that transaction, a transaction that Martin Luther called the great exchange, what happens is Jesus lived that righteous life we should have lived. And so he exchanges his righteous life, puts it in our bank account with God, and so God sees us in the righteousness of Christ and all our sin is given, is imputed, is is exchanged, given to him that he might die for our sins and make full payment. So when God looks at you, he sees Jesus' perfect record, if you know Jesus, if you put your faith in him. And that makes you holy. That makes you acceptable to God. So if you're a Christian, if you're someone whose faith is in Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished for you, then you are holy in his eyes. You are set apart. You are are different from the rest of the population that's out there. Think about that. God has set you apart if you know Jesus. Set apart, you are his. You are his God. He is your God. You are his people. You're a saint. I mean, in this room, we've got St. Troy, we've got, you know, St. Christy. We could go around the room, right? Saint, everyone's a saint if you believe in Jesus Christ. And if you want to put that on your business card, or, but you're a saint. God's set you apart. God has chosen you, maybe for extraordinary things, but definitely to do ordinary things in his name. This woman known as Dorcas, right, in our passage, is kind of exhibit A for the saints here. Like you and me, Dorcas was set apart. She was a vessel that God used for good works. See, God uses ordinary people all the time, you and me, Dorcas. If you're a Christian, God has chosen you, Michelle read for us in Ephesians 2, chosen you from before the beginning of time for good works. God has set you apart for good works to be his ambassadors, to to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. That's who you are if you're in Jesus. God wants to use you for eternal purposes. God didn't just give you a life. God gave you a faith in his son Jesus. Called you out. And you see that in verse 36 in, in Dorcas who was full of good works and acts of charity. We can just blow right by that, but that's something to be looked at and wowed over. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Charity, just another old-fashioned word for love. She wasn't Billy Graham, right? She wasn't Billy Graham. She wasn't Paul. She wasn't Peter. She was Dorcas, chosen by God for good works. 
equally a part of God's plans. God used her for his glory to carry out very ordinary acts of grace. She's there to be an example for us, I believe, in that passage of what it means to care for others in the most practical of ways on a daily basis, day in and day out, just not on Sunday, not Sunday afternoon, let's go out and do some good things, right, but all the time. She's an example of what it means to be the feet and the hands of Jesus to provide love and kindness into a world where there's not a whole lot of that. All of us is called to do the same. And Dorcas' impact wasn't small, and I say that your impact isn't small either. You have no idea the impact sometimes you make on people's lives. Look at verse 39, where Peter comes into the room where Dorcas' dead body is, right? What are the widows doing? They are crying their eyes out over her death, right? Crying their eyes out over Dorcas' death. And what do they show Peter when he comes in? Right, all the things that she had made for them, these poor widows, right? She went out of her way to make these things, this clothing and, and, and all these other textiles, whatever that means. It's probably a lot like what Marilyn did for people. She would make those, those quilts, right? Out of the love of people who needed love. That's what she was doing. And they're just mourning her, mourning the loss of Dorcas. And she was pointing straight to Jesus with her life, right? Dorcas didn't do these things to become a saint, Dorcas did these things because she is a saint or was a saint. She did it because of what Jesus had done for her. Her love of Jesus was her motivation. You know, there's a danger of attributing acts of God to men and to women, but there's an equal danger of thinking that God won't use you. Probably a bigger danger. Thinking, God's never gonna use me. Pastor, this sounds great. That's Dorcas, great. Some of these superstars in our church, right? but not me. Yes, you. If you are a saint, if you know Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in him, if you're trusting in him, God is going to use you. God is using you, and God will use you. <clears throat> that same Peter said, 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. He could be saying that to you. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. For what? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are chosen, you are set apart, not just for acts of charities to others, but to love them into the kingdom of light. If you've been set apart through faith in Jesus Christ, in Jesus' life, his death, his death, 